live streaming series where leaders in information security shed light on the crucial topics that shape our modern cybersecurity landscape. Today, we're joined by Joe Evangelisto, CISO at Tango Analytics. Welcome to today's show, Joe. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation we're about to have. Fantastic. And uh, just to, just on some background there, I can't help but notice you've got classic movie posters in your background. Uh, is that something you're passionate about? You know, I love the old movies and the old style. I think there's something not just nostalgic about it, but also just the amount of work that went into those without a lot of technology and what they were able to accomplish, I think was just amazing. Uh, so yeah, definitely a fan. Any particular favorites? Uh, Frankenstein, for sure. He's definitely always been a favorite, so... Okay, cool. I will check that out afterwards. Thank you. And um, getting into the business of information security, let's let's talk about your current role at Tango. Um, if I remember, you were hired as the first CISO, which gives you a pretty unique perspective. Um, what challenges or what opportunities have you encountered in shaping the security posture of a company, really from the ground up? You know, it's it's been a good year. It's been a fun year, right? But it definitely, like you said, lots of challenges along the way, the least of which is, is helping other people understand what my role is and what it is I'm trying to help them accomplish. Um, I think most people have a sense of what security is and, and the importance of it. But I think there's a lot more nuance there than they realize, and a lot more complexity, a lot more work that has to happen. And it doesn't happen overnight, right? It takes, it takes time. It takes time to build the program, to define it, to find your, you know, your partners, to find your champions, uh, to get yourself into a position where you're actually moving along. Um, it can take longer than you wanted to as well. You think, oh, I got this. We're rolling here. We're going to get these things set up. And then you're three months down the road and you're like, what have I got accomplished? Have I got anything done? Right. It just, you know, and then a year later you realize, oh, we've gotten a lot done. Right. But it doesn't always feel that way. All right, and and getting into some more of the specifics, like um, have you have they been business challenges that you've run into so far, or have they been technology challenges, or have has it been a blend? I think it's been a been a blend, right? I think um, you know the business challenge is back to having people understand what is you're trying to help them accomplish, right? At the end of the day, you're I'm not trying to be a blocker, right? I'm not trying to come in and say you can't do X, Y, or Z. What I'm trying to do is, is help them you know, basically be able to offer a product that meets our customers' needs while also being secure, right? At the end of the day, <clears throat> if we don't sell, right, um, then we don't make money, then we don't, you know, we're not profitable and then we don't have jobs. So security is a part of that and people don't understand that enough, right? My job is to help the salespeople as well, not just make the company secure, but also to help them. And so that has its own challenges of you trying to navigate that path. Um, sometimes there's resistance, sometimes there's misunderstandings um, or frustrations, and you have to work through all those, right? And then you throw in the technical challenge on top of that, of you know, trying to be security both for the product side of the house and the corporate side of the house and everything in between. And, you know, understanding that like, oh, well, this system doesn't talk to this system the way we expect it to, now we got to fix that, right? And the, and the things that happen along that are just, it's difficult. It's difficult. And it may, oftentimes it's slow. That's what slows you down is oftentimes the technical challenge is more than the process challenge. But I really like the point you, you, you led with there, which is the alignment with the go to market team, because I, I think for a long time, cybersecurity and information security have been considered to be an IT problem or a technology problem, or it's something we're gonna go solve that we're going to be able to you know, fix the thing. And uh, I think that's a false narrative at this point. And I, I personally believe, and I, I think you'll, uh, I hope you'll agree with me on this one, um, that really done well, cybersecurity is functionally a business enabler. And whether that comes to having a trust center or, or policies and procedures that you can share with at uh, least policies and attestations that you can share with your clients or prospects so that we don't end up sending like 1200 page SIG uh, standard information gathering questionnaires to one another in the idea that it's going to somehow mitigate risk, right? But rather we can, we can smooth that sales transition path for uh, those of us in business to business sales so that instead of, you know, sending each other questionnaires, we can say, no, here's proof that I actually have done the cybers okay. Um, and let's skip past that whole conversation on risk unless you have a specific concern. Does that make sense to you? 
No, absolutely. And it's something that, you know, we did at my last company. So we're trying to do here as well is, is to find out that, you know, balance of here's the information you actually need from me, right? So you would be comfortable that our product is secure, that we're doing the right things, that you can trust us with your data, that we're going to protect you, right? Um, without going too crazy with it, right? Because at the end of the day, I know I've done well when we provide that to our customer or our potential customer, and they don't have any more questions, right? Either one, maybe they're not doing it as deep a time as maybe they should, but at the end of the day, my feeling is like, look, hopefully I've done a good enough job. They kind of go, oh, all my questions I had, you answered with the documents supplied me, with the questions you already answered, and I can feel comfortable with this. And we can now move away from me being worried about the security of the product and focus on what the product can do for my company, the features it has, the benefits it's going to offer. Um, but but again, that takes time and, and not every company is going to be happy with what you provide them. You still have to get on calls, right? You still have to do presentations. You know, I had one last mm-hmm. week. I have one next week where I'll be sitting in front of customers and walking them through our security architecture and, and what we do and what we have in place and answer questions. Um, and that's just that's just part of the job. And that's something you have to expect. Um, it's not necessarily the most fun part of the job. I'm not a sales guy. Um, but it is something that yeah, I realize that I have to do. Uh, and to help the company, you know, grow. And now you've been with with Tango for I think over a year now. And um, speaking of those external attestations, I we talked about how you're preparing the company for future FedRAMP certification. Um, what's that process look like for our viewers? And um, you know, for those of us who've already got like a SOC, a SOC two, or even a SOC one, how does that FedRAMP process really vary from maintaining your existing SOC status? So yeah, so we're fortunate. We already have at least some FedRAMP authorizations. So we're FedRAMP Live SaaS for one of our products. But while I was here, we did expand that to add additional products into the Live SaaS space, right? So low impact SaaS. Um, the thing that has struck me the most about FedRAMP, because you're right, it's my first journey into it, is the sheer amount of ongoing, you know, documentation and support uh, information you have to provide the agencies, right? Every month, hey, here's all the poems we have for this month, here are all the things we're addressing, here's this documentation, all the things you have to upload continually every month, right? It's not like SOC where you basically, you know you're supposed to do things throughout the year and at the end of the year you present it all to the auditor. This one, you're literally every month providing them that information on an ongoing basis. At any point in time, an agency can raise their hand and say, hey, we need to meet. I I, I have a question about this vulnerability or this thing you've done here or I have concerns about that. We need to discuss X, Y, or Z, right? So there's a lot there, and it's a lot more work than people realize that staying on top of the ongoing scans and the remediations and, and all that is, is it's no small feat for sure. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a continuous in process of, well, I mean, as we said, security is a continuous process, but it sounds like FedRAMP's really leaned in on that. And I suppose the follow-up question then is, has that changed how you're thinking about staffing so that you're able to delegate more of the responsibilities associated with maintaining that FedRAMP certification? Or is that something that you as the, you know, <laughs> the, the worry of the classic CISO, you know, doing the whole Atlas thing and holding up the whole world, is that more your, your role right now? So I'm very fortunate that I have a, a, a PM. Well, she was a PM, but I basically uh, came on board and was like, oh, you're doing a great job. You're now my compliance specialist. So I kind of pulled her over. Um, but I basically have a, a compliance specialist and her job, you know, I say 90% of it is veteran, right? It's, it's essentially acting almost like a project manager for the monthly continuous monitoring we have to do. And then the yearly audits, or if we want to do a, you know, reauthorization or expansion in the middle of the year. So she kind of owns all of that. So she helps own documentation, the scans, and the work. Right now, she's basically acting again like a PM. She's coordinating all this amongst other, you know, DevOps employees for the scans or me for looking at, you know, right, updating policies or signing off on things. So I'm able to lean on her quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, I feel like if you don't have that, I don't know how you survive, right? I feel like it's such a it's such a big amount of work, right? It's not something I think you could do in my mind. I couldn't do this and do the other work I have to do as a CISO and be successful, right? Balls will get dropped somewhere. Things will get missed. Um, you know, and you definitely need someone who is got a key eye for, for detail, right? Is very attention oriented because there's a lot in these things that require you to just not just read it, but read it a couple of times before you really understand, oh, 
this is what they're expecting from me and how often they're expecting from me and so forth. It's, it's a lot of work. And I can imagine that how often part is uh, so important just to prevent any balls from being dropped. And I also want to say right now, uh, if you're watching the show on LinkedIn or Restream or on YouTube and you've got a question, uh, please do drop it in the comments on that platform and we will be taking your questions live. So I want to do a shout out to Benjamin Coral, uh, who said, Poems, love it, Joe, plan of action and milestones. And it's a continuous process. Totally agree with that. Right, Joe? It's a continuous mm -hmm. process here with Poems. Never stop. Never stop. You you love it too, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's jump back to your previous role at uh, at Mercury Gate. You'd mentioned transitioning the company security to a, a risk based approach. Can you talk a little bit about what sparked that transition and how it's different from? It's funny, actually, trying to think of like a security strategy that wouldn't be risk-based. Like how, how a risk-based strategy is whatever they were doing beforehand? So I think, you know, what I walked into essentially was a very reactive space, right? They were doing things, but it was all reacting to what was happening around them, right? Something would occur, they'd react to it. Something would occur, they'd react to it, right? It's not to say they weren't secure, but it wasn't, there was no real kind of plan, right? It was just like constantly like just dealing with whatever was coming at them, right? not a good way to really have a long-term goal or plan or kind of move your security maturity up in any way, shape or form. You were kind of always stuck where you were. So that's really what it was. It was more about helping them, you know, to get their arms around it um, and to create a plan to move forward to get better, right? So we can stop reacting to things and start being proactive at addressing those things, right? So, you know, identifying potential risks coming down the pipe and getting ahead of them if we can, right? identifying concerns our customers may have with our product from a security perspective that we need to then put in place before it gets raised, right? So the idea is just that you're trying to, essentially almost trying to read the tea leaves to a certain extent mm -hmm. and, and then put a plan in place to address those things before they become an issue while also dealing with the ongoing normal security things that happen like vulnerabilities and patch Tuesdays and those kind of things, right? So it's a bit of a mixture, but the idea is to try to make it into more of a proactive conversation with executives around what their actual true risks are and how to address those or not if they want to accept that and, and then moving forward. And now when, when we talk about risks, I, I have to ask, and I apologize in advance for leading the witness, Joe, but um, do you see cyber risks as necessarily different than business risks, like warranting a, a specific different treatment, or are they in fact the same thing? No, they're definitely different, right? The risks that we face from a purely technical cyber landscape is different than the risks that a finance team faces or HR. Um, and that's why it's really important that you have those relationships with those departments, right? And you work with them. And, and what you'll find is, Lisa, what I have found so far is more often than not, the finance team is much more aware of risk and are, mm -hmm. are actively addressing it than most other teams, right? They, they have lived the world of like, you know, being careful of how they handle deposits or authorizing, you know, uh, payments or things like that. So they oftentimes have had, you know, already had checkpoints and gates in place, uh, you know, to handle those things. Um, and so talking to them about that has been very beneficial and uh, really helpful because it also helps open your eyes up how maybe you can leverage that in other areas as well. All right. And, and just thinking of that, because you're talking about working with um, different people, you've, you've actually worked with various size organizations, too. So when you think about the role of a CISO, uh, a chief information security officer, how, how would you say it differs between being a CISO at a small to, to medium sized business uh, versus a larger corporation? And, you know, are there any adjustments you've had to, to make to your approach as a CISO when you've moved between small, medium-sized businesses and bigger enterprises? So I'll say for me, I've only ever been really a CISO at a small, medium-sized business, right? So, but I have been a manager, the director of IT and stuff at larger organizations, right? And for me, really, the big difference is it's, it's while you have the same amount of scope, right? The breadth of the work is the same, right? It's how you get it done, it differs. You know, when I was managing larger teams, right, I was able to delegate those tasks out to other people. I was able to sit down and talk through those kind of things and work with them and so forth. But oftentimes I wasn't hands-on. Oftentimes I was 
you know, solving problems, having meetings, leading people along, helping career paths, things like that, right? While also trying to meet objectives and, and some project goals and things like that. But when you're at a small company, like I've been in the past too, you're oftentimes doing that while also being hands-on, right? And you're also outsourcing some of those functions to a third party as opposed to someone in-house. And that's a very different relationship as well. And so, you know, you tend to be a little bit more spread, I think, a little bit more thin, right? So you're a little bit all over the place. So, you know, like today, right? I came in today and I had tickets that I was actually working on, right? I'm helping to close out some tickets, I'm going to address some issues. I'm making sure, you know, that, you know, MDM is being rolled out to devices and configuring configuration policies and such. And then I had to switch over to audit, right? And help run down some audit tasks and identify, you know, some evidence that need to be gathered and gathering those and so forth. So it's it's very, you do a lot of context switching uh, back and forth uh, amongst, you know, these things. I think you do that more so when you're at a, a small business than you do probably a larger, you probably have a little more time to spend, you know, in those areas because you're not the one doing the work, you're just kind of, you know, supporting as you do. Okay, and I, I, I see we also have a, an audience question here, Joe. Um, a post on LinkedIn about Black Hat uh, that got a lot of attention. Um, so uh, maybe ta- tell us a little bit for the audience who don't remember that particular post, um, you know, what the post was about and uh, what's happened since that post and if anybody changed your mind. <laughs> yeah, so that post kind of went a little crazy. I mean, I wasn't expecting that at all. So. I simply, I got a lot of requests prior to Black Hat saying, hey, if you're a Black Hat, I'm going to, you know, meet us up for lunch. You want to go out, whatever, from different vendors. And so I decided, you know what, I'm just going to dip this in the bud, right? So I figured I'd just post something on LinkedIn and said, hey, this PSA, I'm not attending Black Hat, right? But I kind of went a little further and said, I'm not attending Black Hat because in my mind, you know, the audience that Black Hat has and similar conferences that size are for much larger enterprise CISOs, right? They're not always focused on how the needs and, and how the people at my level have to work and function, right? I'm not saying it's not a great event. I'm not saying it doesn't have its purpose, but I think for me, there's not a lot of benefit, right? So I hear all this stuff and, and I'll come back and be like, great, how do I implement that? Well, I can't, right? Because it's just at a level that I, either you're not mature enough for, or maybe you're just not large enough for, right? So, you know, that's kind of where I landed, right? I would say lots of people came back and said, well, you've never been, so you don't understand, or you know, maybe you need to uh, go and, and appreci- to appreciate it, or you know, you're missing out on all the value it has besides those things. And, and they may be perfectly right. I'm not saying that I'm completely, you know, averse to it. I'm just saying, in my experience, when I've gone to a couple of the larger events, that's been my experience. Right? Is they're very inspirational. I'm wrong. Like some of those talks are fantastic, but when the rubber hits the road, there's not a lot of you know meat for me to be able to use on a day-to-day basis. That's fair. That's fair. Well, what I'll tell you is um, I, I attended Black Hat this year, um, mostly to catch up with old friends and uh, some new. And I'll tell you, the, the thing that I felt having been there is they took out the carpet. And that sounds minor. They did it for environmental reasons. They had signs up saying how it's going to save on diesel and save on trucking and, and all that. And uh, it was loud in there. I wished by about 10 a.m. I wished that I had had earplugs in just so that it would like go down to a dull roar as opposed to the continuous like rock concert feel that it had. Um, so yeah, next year Black Hat uh, if they pull that one again. <laughs> But one of the topics that we wanted to talk about, though, beyond that, was about uh, how to retain information security personnel. And uh, you talked a little bit about like outsourcing and use of managed service providers. So talk about vendors, because we're seeing this series of rapid changes in our security landscape. So uh, what strategies have you really found for retaining a skilled workforce? Yeah, so I think, you know, when it comes to when you have someone who's working for you on the cybersecurity side, and I had this at my last place where I had a security admin who worked for me, right? A young gentleman, very talented, uh, very ambitious, you know, he wanted to learn and grow and such. And, and I think you have to come in knowing that you only have so much you can offer them at the end of the day, right? Um, you know, I, I'm, it's a small team, right? So there's only so much he can grow and he can do. There's so much I can give him before he reaches this peak, at which point they're going to have to leave to move on and, and learn more. Perfectly normal, right? I think we've all been there in our career. And I think the way I approached I took with him was, look, one, 
I will always share with you everything I know that I'm allowed to share with you. I don't hold information back. So I'm not going to hold things back and you're not sharing things with me. I had every time I needed to make a decision, I involved him, right? Whether it made sense or not, just because I wanted him to be informed. I wanted to hear other sides of it as well. Um, and then I also, you know, did my best to try to challenge him along the way and keep that conversation of career path and what do you want to do and what was next in his life on the radar, right? Knowing at some point he was going to get to the point where he's like, you know what, this is great and all, but, but I got to move on to grow. And it, it was expected, right? It was totally expected. And that's essentially what ended up happening. Um, but I think that's what you have to do, right? You have to have that honest conversation on a regular basis. So what I do is I have my standard weekly one-on-ones with all my staff, right? But then I have a separate monthly one-on-one that is not about your tasks, your day-to-day work. It's about your career. Where are you with your goals? And where are you, where are you your career? And how can I help support both? Right? It's a, it's try, I try to make it a different conversation. I try to make it about like, you know, are, are you, is there training you need to go to? Is there something to learn? Is how can I help you get there? And, and so forth. And I would hope that by doing that, that helps kind of extend how long they stay before they move on, right? So that's kind of the approach I take as as well as to try to kind of keep that open conversation all the time. Right, right, right. And that's that's a good strategy, I'd say, for actually understanding what people want to do and what goals they have, rather than um, some organizations where I've seen goals have been handed out from high. And uh, depending on the organization's culture, that either works really well or mm, not so much. I imagine you've seen about the same. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I think in the small companies, you tend to have less of that, right? It tends to be more... Um, what do you want to do this year? Okay, that sounds good kind of thing, right? So it's more left up to the employees, I think, more than larger ones. Right? Larger ones tend to have like strategic goals at the top level and it kind of trickles on down to, to you know, where you are at your level. Um, but oftentimes in smaller ones, uh, it's just something that gets, gets missed. So unless you as a manager kind of own that and really kind of uh, help them define those and make those worthwhile and beneficial, they don't really buy into it. Right. So it really becomes down to you as a manager, knowing how to make that a valuable uh, a way of, of managing their their career and their work and help them feel like they actually are contributing to the success of the company. All right, let's continue this conversation. I want, I want to go in a slightly different direction and talk about work life balance, because that's something that like often we don't talk about enough inside of our community. Uh, although recently there have been some conversations around mental health, especially associated with CISOs and um, our continuing mental health challenges that many of us struggle from because of just the workload. Uh, so how, how do you actually maintain a healthy work-life balance while you're actually staying ahead or at least staying on top of cybersecurity? Sure, yeah, I would say I learned, you know, I spent my first 20 years as an infrastructure guy, right? So in infrastructure teams, you know, teams that had to be 24 seven, 365 on call, large parts of my life as well. And I think often, honestly, that helped prepare me for security, right? Cause it helped me understand how to manage my life such that it wasn't gonna be overwhelming, right? And so what I really learned through those years and I didn't always do it successfully, right? Early in my career, like I was too involved to all compass about the work too much thinking about it right but as it went on i started to learn to like that was unhealthy right it wasn't helpful for me i wasn't getting the break i needed i was stressing out it wasn't helpful for my family right and so i had to learn how to just kind of like be okay and walk away and i think that's really where i'm in today which is the end of the day the way i look at it is look i can only do so much in a day i'm not going to solve the world's problems i'm not going to you know fix everything that's going on and I may not be prepared for every possible contingent attack that may happen to me on the security front. I can only do what I can do. And that's okay. And so that's kind of the approach I take. Like at the end of the day, you know, my, my day ends 5, 5.30, whatever it is, close my computer and I walk away. And I try not to think about it. No way to like, hey, I have, I have contingencies in place. If something goes wrong, somebody calls me. So if nobody's calling me, hopefully I've done a good job and things are okay, right? Now, if someone does call me, okay, then then the process we put in place to identify something has worked. And now we work on it, we address it, and then we close it out, we move on, right? But it's that idea of like trying to give yourself that that permission to be able to just say, you know what? I don't have to monitor this 24-7. I don't have to constantly look at my email. I don't have to constantly fret about this stuff. Because um, at the end of the day, it's 
it, it's still going to be there tomorrow or the next day or the next. It's never, never going to stop, right? It's the gift that keeps on giving. So you have to be okay <laughs> walking away. So. And the gift that keeps on giving. I think that's the first time I've ever heard of our industry described in those terms. Um, <laughs> might borrow that. Um, we have a question from the chat, though. Uh, and the question is, uh, how do we get budget or a convince a CFO, a chief financial officer, that security is not just a cost center? And I know I've got some strong feelings about this one, of course, but um, Joe, the show's about you. So how have you done that successfully in the past to transition from being a cost center? So I, I think really it goes back to you have to have understanding of what matters to your CFO and your company as a whole, right? Every CFO is different in how they manage, uh, you know, their their money, how they want to handle things, so forth, right? They have different takes on things, so you, it's important to have those conversations, understand where their mind is, what their focus is, what they're trying to accomplish, right? Because they have goals too, just like you. You're trying to make things more secure. They have goals as well. They're trying to be. So you want to try to align with those as best as possible. So I think the first thing really is just talk to them, understand them, understand what they're trying to do, right? And you'll also be surprised to understand where they come from. You know, my last CFO, he had a very good understanding of security. And I think it's because he'd probably been through places where they had problems because they weren't. And so he saw the ramifications of that. And so as a result, he was much more aware than a lot of CFOs I worked before. And that benefited me, right? And it wasn't, didn't say he didn't challenge me when I requested things, but it was a different conversation, right? You know, I would say really it's about, that's, that's the first step is understanding what they know, what they understand, what they're trying to accomplish. And then you have to then tailor your approach to that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the approach I do. I, I try to really understand what the business is trying to do and understand and try to present it in the way they, they usually get presented to. I don't want to take the way I've done it last time because last time I don't work this time. So, and it's not always successful, right? You know, there are going to be times, most of the time, they're going to say no. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So what I always push back is like, fine, if not now, when? Or if you can't do it now, what do I need to do to get this in next year? Or how can we change this thing? Or, or can we wait till the second half and look at it up that way as well, right? So you definitely can't go in as an all or nothing approach. you got to go right. in and be willing to be flexible. You want to give or take a little bit. Maybe you go in, you ask, hey, I need this. And it's going to cost 50 grand. And they go, well, that's not going to happen. All right, can I get 25? Like, can I get, you know, let's let's negotiate here a little bit. Let's let's go back uh -huh. and forth. Like, what is, what is feasible? Oh, I can't get it now. Can I get it in the second half? Like, if we have a good first half of the year, what would be money available in the second half of the year? Okay, let's let's talk about that, right? So it's having a flexibility as well is going to going to benefit you. I That has helped me a lot, which is, is oftentimes things will get pushed off the second half. They're like, look. We understand the value. Money's tight. Because everyone's asking for stuff. It's not just you. You know, mm -hmm. everyone, HR wants their, their tool, right? And, you know, finance has tools they want and sales has things they want to do, right? So you're fighting with everyone else for these small pot of money. So we got to stop coming and thinking that only security matters. That, that's kind of ridiculous, right? It's a business. And they need to base their decisions based on what's going to benefit the business. That's not always security. So really just partnering and, and maintaining open communications, being flexible and understanding other people's motivations then. Absolutely. Absolutely. And right. sometimes you, it's beneficial to partner with some of those other departments, right? You know, you know, they're getting something coming in in the first half. Maybe you, you move yours to the seconds or vice versa. You flip things around, right? So I think it's always helpful to understand what other departments are trying to accomplish as well. So maybe you can tap onto it. I mean, you know, you got to get creative. Uh, in this industry, for sure. Yeah, that's definitely true. Well, I had one other planned question for you today, Joe, which is just around liability, and uh, particularly for CISOs who don't have directors and officers insurance, who might have also heard it called DNO. Um, um, so, what are some controls that you've put in place to to mitigate your personal liabilities uh, as being a CISO, even if you don't have DNO? Yeah, I mean, I think it really goes down to you. You need to understand what your risk is, and you need to make sure that that risk is being presented to the executive team, right? At the end of the day, you know, my job is not always, is not to decide what we do about the risk. My end of the day is to define it, identify how we mitigate it, present it to my leadership and say, what do you want to do about this? You need to make this decision, right? I will support whichever way you want to go. I may disagree with you, I may have some conversations around it, but at the end of the day, I need them to weigh in and make that decision. And then that all has to be documented. You got to document that. Right? You can't just like have a hallway conversation 
and then say, well, no, 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 we discussed this and that's why we didn't do that, right? Now it's gotta be actually documented in a, in more of a formal way, right? Mm-hmm. So like, we have monthly risk control board meetings in which the execs are a part of, right? So we'll have those conversations there. I have ongoing you know, bi-weekly meetings with my CEO in which we talk about security decisions we need to make and what's going on, right? You know, you, we do an annual risk assessment in which we look across all departments and identify those risks. That's a formal report that I write up that gets signed off on by my boss and gets presented to the, you know, to the executives as well, right? All those things to me, while not perfect, will help to mitigate some of the risk that I would take on normally, right? Fantastic. So really getting things in writing if you will, in a formal sense, not just YOLO in your security budget or um, making decisions on your own. Again, it's that collaboration. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, it's it's that ongoing conversation with those departments, right? You need to understand, you know, what those departments risks are. And you can't do that by just, you know, sitting in your office and, and sending off an email, right? You have to go and talk to them. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, with that, uh, we've kind of come to time. So I want to thank to everyone for joining today. I want to thank Joe. Thanks for being on our first live stream on LinkedIn, as well as uh, Restream and YouTube. And uh, with that, if you like the Hyperproof page on, on LinkedIn, uh, we do have a QR code for it there. You can type in the URL. Uh, you'll be notified when we're hosting another live stream. And uh, alternatively, if you want to be a guest on this series or enjoy a beer with Tom and I while we talk about FedRAMP, uh, do message me directly on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. With that, I want to thank everyone again. Thanks, Joe. Great seeing you again, and enjoy your day. Thank you.